Okay, so I'll just dive in. Um, I suppose first and foremost, now I, I can't see you guys anymore, so I'll uh, I'll just turn you guys off. <coughs> but I can still see myself, which is always slightly disconcerting. Um, so for the next, I suppose, 45 minutes, what I'm really interested in doing is exploring the, the different ways that we can learn from people who are not digital people, who aren't creating digital experiences. Um, when Lisa approached me about this seminar, uh, I've done a lot of talking about um, how people can be influenced online. My, my original thesis work was looking at influence in social networks, and I was, I was kind of extrapolating on the way that you know online relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, can be as influential because of the same offline um, processes as you know as online as we experience online. Those are elements of trust, of notions of credibility, of interpersonal ideas about social comparison um, and prototypicality. However. I have talked a lot about that over the last three or four years, and I thought to myself, actually, there could be an interesting other way of looking at this question of behavior change and influence in digital spaces. And part of the reason for that, and I suppose we can go to the next slide now, um, is the idea that digital artifacts are, are storytelling devices. More and more I'm coming to this conclusion that, that when you're designing, when you're creating um, virtual artifacts, what you're ultimately doing, um, even if you're going to Amazon, even if you're going to eBay, or if you're going into an immersive virtual world like Second Life, or if you're going onto Facebook, or if you're downloading an app, they're storytelling devices. And you, as the consumer, are the hero. Um, my background is in computer games as a, as a journalist is, I think, something that sort of, that, that has kind of cued that up, shall we say. Um, in terms of how we interact with these devices, how it is that we interact with these systems and the processes. And so I wanted to, to look at the different ways that other people tell stories. How is it, and we can go to the next slide, um, how is it that we tell stories offline that isn't mediated by a screen necessarily, but is part of our five senses, you know, our, our smell, touch, sound, taste, and feel. No, what are they? Smell, touch, sound, Taste. Oh, somebody help me out here. Touch. Smell. Touch. Yeah. Smell. Touch. Oh, God. Well, anyway, five cents. <laughs> Sight. Sight. That's right. I can't see anything. So there, there you go. Um, smell, touch, sound, taste, and sight. And um, we can tell stories in all of those ways offline. It's quite exciting when you think about how much we're kind of, um, how much we interact with the world, how much we're bombarded by the various things, and how much some people, through their creative, output are manipulating those things. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, the web itself is a lean medium. There's a lot of people who talk about that, particularly when they're talking about relationships, when they're talking about um, influence. They say, you know, how can we possibly influence one another? We're interacting with the computer screen. Of course, forgetting that they're usually, if we're looking at um, sort of uh, social interactions, there's usually somebody on the other side of the screen. But it is really a lean medium. And ironically, it's, it's a lean medium in the way that it can only tell stories in one way, through sight, which is the one that I forgot. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a device that, in some ways, we can interact with. But really, we're only consuming through our eyes. Um, if we go to the next slide. This is not the only medium to struggle with this problem. I mean, television has experienced this, radio has experienced this, any kind of storytelling medium has experienced this because it's quite difficult to convey stories in multiple modalities. And if we jump to the next slide, Lisa, um, we'll get, a, we'll get a, a picture of somebody who I adore. I am William um, Castle, the director of the motion picture you're about to see. I feel obligated to warn you that some of the sensations some of the physical reactions which the actors on the screen will feel will also be experienced for the first time in motion picture history by certain members of this audience. I say certain members because some people are more sensitive to these mysterious electronic impulses than others. These uh, unfortunate sensitive people will at times feel a strange tingling sensation. 
Others will feel it less strongly. But don't be alarmed. You can protect yourself. At any time you are conscious of a tingling sensation, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. Don't be embarrassed about opening your mouth and letting rip with all you've got, because the person in the seat right next to you will probably be screaming too. You might want to turn Remember it down, this. by the way. It's about to start. Scream screaming. at the right oh, okay. time. It may save your life. <laughs> shock film director from the 1950s and in fact uh, I had the opportunity to interview his daughter and recently and we talked a lot about his experience um, as a filmmaker who in who had a background in the theater um, and what he what he found with this new medium he, he thought it was an amazing way to tell stories and he really wanted to um, to entertain to get people immersed to get people really engaged with his with his stories but what he found was that the, the medium itself, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about this later, the medium itself was a one-dimensional storytelling device. It was a transmissive storytelling device. And so what he did very famously, and, and that, that is from his film The Tingler, which is probably one of, his more fam one of his more famous gimmicks, is he tried as much as he could to take the activity that was on the screen and actually bring it into the theater. It was possible at that time to do it with a range of devices uh, because there were limited uh, reels, there were limited film reels. And so literally he would go on a, on a road show and he would pick up his, his reel and he would pick up his various devices and he'd move from theater to theater around the United States. Um, and so it was possible then to do that because it was, a, it was a limited audience and there were limited resources. The Tingler, actually, uh, if, if you don't know, and I don't know if you do know, it was a, a, an awful film. All of his films were awful. Um, <laughs> but people went to see them in droves because of the gimmicks. And what he did was he created, um, or rather he put, uh, sort of, he basically electrified several seats in the theater. And at a particular moment <laughs> in the film, um, the, project the, projectionist push the projectionist pushed a button um, and those seats that were electrified, <laughs> and it was actually more like a, a device that just shook the seats, um, because the tingler, the, the, the creature that was sort of turning people crazy, and the only way that you could stop the tingler from getting you um, was by screaming, the tingler was loose in the theater, and then the person, the projectionist pushed the button, and the seats started shaking, and the people in the seats were freaking out, and everybody in the cinema just started screaming. And that's just one of the examples of, of what it was that he did in order to immerse people um, and get people to get the sensation of being inside the experience, even though what he was actually telling a story with was a was a, a basically a one-dimensional object. Um, some of his other uh, some of his other gimmicks were really fantastic. His very first one was he took out um, a one thousand dollar life insurance policy on everybody who came to see his very first film, which was terrible in case anybody had a heart attack and died in the you know, in the film because it was so frightening. And it was it was backed by Lloyd's of London. So, you know, it was actually a thing. Nobody died. Um, but yeah, fascinating, yeah, at least that we know. And preconditions did not apply. Um, you had to be quite upfront about it when you got your, your certificate. Um, but but that's just an example of how people were trying to do it in the past. And obviously you can see how people are trying to do that in the cinema right now through things like Smell-O-Vision, which is coming back. I just read an article in Time Magazine um, about how there are several companies in the U.S. who are trying to create devices that will um, squirt scents into people's noses uh, at particular moments in, in, uh, in a cinema experience. Um, and, you know, then in various films, you know, you've seen Philorama and all this kind of thing. Now, of course, we have things like 3D, and that's trying to get us into the experience. But at present, we're pretty limited uh, online by what it is that we can do and how it is that we can get people completely engaged in the story. And the reason why I'm particularly interested in how we get people engaged in the story is because that's actually uh, the story that, that you know de developers are, are trying to tell is because that's actually when we're um, when we're most sensitive to being influenced and having our behavior changed. So if we quickly go to the uh, the next slide, Lisa. 
So although we might not be able to replicate the, the offline experience uh, in, as, as William Castle was unable to do with his, his film, he, would, he had to kind of create extra things in order to get people more interested in his quite terrible films, and they were hugely successful because of it. We can actually learn from it. So um, in the next, I think it's about a 27 minute video, so get yourselves comfortable. I'm hoping that it's entertaining enough. You're gonna see three people. The first person is Nick Ryan, who is a sound designer. Um, Nick <coughs> has designed a whole bunch of different sound experiences, including um, what, what is called a sort of 3D binaural sound, which is basically by, by sticking your headphones on and closing your eyes, you do get the sense that you're actually inside um, a, a physical environment. And he turned that, uh, with the help of a production company, and this is a digital experience, into uh, um, uh, an iPhone game that's called Papa Sangre, in which you stick your headphones on, you close your eyes, and you actually interact through the game only with sound. It's, it's quite an amazing experience. The second person that you're going to hear from is Apologies. The, the video um, has quite a lot of sound uh, disruption because we were filming outside, and it suddenly became a windy day. Um, is a woman named Lizzie Ostrom, uh, who is also known as Odette Toilette, who is a scent creator. And she created a fascinating product that was um, called Ode with the Design Council in, uh, in England, um, which was to help people with dementia recall when they had to eat. And we'll find out how she did that. And that was purely through, through scent. And then the last person is a guy named Jane, uh, John Wardley, who was a roller coaster designer. Um, uh, I got really excited interviewing him. <laughs> uh, he, de he designs roller coasters including Nemesis and Oblivion at Alton Towers. Uh, if anybody's been to Alton Towers and had the, the bejesus scared out of them on either Oblivion or Nemesis. Um, and they'll talk for about half an hour. Out the back of that, we'll just have a quick discussion, a roundup, um, with some of the, some of the things that, that I've pulled out from, from their stories. And also, it would be great to open it up and have a conversation about how we can use those learnings from these people who are creating sensations outside the digital world um, and how, how digital technologies can be more immersive, how we can learn those lessons. So Lisa, we can, uh, we can start the video. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Sure. I'm Nick Ryan, and I'm a sound designer, composer, and artist. Our sensation of sound is different to any of our other senses, and the, obviously it's different because it's one of the senses, but the way that sound exists uh, physically uh, by nature of the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a wave-based uh, physical form, and the way that our auditory modality has accommodated that physical entity makes our sensation of sound completely different to the way we interact with a visual object, for example. How so? Well, we, we can't examine sound in the same way that we do uh, a painting, for example. You can't um, pause it, you can't pick it up, you can't walk behind it and look at it from the other side, you can't sort of um, focus on it. It's there one second, it's gone the next. So temporally, it's very interesting because you have to experience it in the present only. But paradoxically, it has no meaning outside the body. So it's completely meaningless until it's associated with the past. So we're experiencing it, it in the very present moment, but it's meaningless until we associate it with memory. So you could think of sound as being like scent or like um, haptic sensation like hot or cold instantaneously you experience sound as a sensation like like touching something hot but then um, a moment later you cogitate it and then it then it requires meaning it's the same with scent it doesn't mean anything <clears throat> I think sound is um, both sensual in the in the same way that scent is um, but it's also functional in a way that, I mean, one could say that obviously smell is functional, but sound it has more function navigationally, I think, than smell, um, in the sense that we, um, some sounds 
are inextricably linked with the physical objects that make them. And that's the primary kind of response is to associate them with physics, with, with something that makes that sound and derive meaning from that. Um, but something with something like music, for example, you would skip that point and rather than you know thinking about what is making those sounds in an orchestra, for example, if you heard a piece of classical music, you wouldn't immediately think violin, 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 cello, 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 cello. You know, you would think of the thing that you associate that with emotionally. So you think of the first time you might have heard that piece of music or you, you would think of something um, similar that you know and you would think of the times that you've heard those and the places that you've heard those in. I think there's a really, really fundamental reason why sound, immersion in sound works in the way it does and is so um, believable and compelling. I think my theory goes something like this. When, um, when we were sort of Paleolithic, um, we could pretty much guarantee, or we could guarantee that when we heard a sound, we were fairly close to the thing that made the sound. And we learned what things made what sound. So that's why <clears throat> my theory says that when we hear a sound, like a lighter, for example, we visualize. Some people do it without their eyes closed, but if you close your eyes and you hear a, a recording of a lighter, for example, you can visualize the thing that makes it. In fact, you can't not visualize that. So, and that visualization happens because we assume, because we did for the last 70,000 years, that what's making the sound is the thing that makes that sound, and we are next to it. So it's very implausible that, oh, it has been completely implausible until this point, that the thing that makes the sound and the sound are disconnected. So our assumption neurologically is that, or cognitively, is that um, that thing exists in the same space as us right now. So when you play a recording, um, your brain makes the assumption that you are experiencing that firsthand and we've yet to kind of understand on a kind of very a very low level that recordings are possible we don't tend to think of recorded sound as being something that you can interact with um, by, by its very nature a recording is non-interactive or it has been for the last hundred years and now we can actually um, we can actually immerse ourselves in a, a, a heard experience uh, by having some interaction with it, um, perhaps in creating a, a, a virtual space in which you can sort of imagine yourself to be, um, or simply by changing um, what you hear according to your behaviour and being. A body acting in a space uh, which influences what you hear makes a big difference to how you experience the sound because you are even if you're not making the sound if you're affecting it in some way you you become um, an active participant and and that's immersion. Papa Sangre is is an obvious choice because it's about immersion in sound. Um, it's a it's a game that players play on the iPhone. And um, they put a pair of headphones on, they're immersed in a, in a, in a 3D audio world. There are no uh, graphics, there's no graphical representation of space at all. Um, so unlike most uh, first person um, games, there's no um, navigation in space, visual navigation in space. So everything is done in sound and being freely and being freely sound they're able to um, tell not just where where the sound is coming from the left or the right but above beneath in front or behind them um, and they the, the the game is on is made for the iPhone so they use the touch screen interface um, to effectively walk with their thumbs through this world and that advances them through a landscape um, 
and it, many of the tropes kind of associated with adventure games are true in this case in the sense that you are trying to avoid peril, uh, you're trying to collect things, um, and you're trying to move from one level to the next. Acting on sound is, is crucial to the level of physicality you have in the imagined space. So um, being able to, and interaction feedback obviously is vital. So if you're able to hear the effects of your action on that space, then you feel like you are a body acting in space and that you are actually there. So um, that has really interesting um, effects on uh, sort of the UI, for example. We have a, a UI in Papasangre which is based on um, the concept of, of walking with your thumbs, as though your thumbs your feet. Very, very quickly, because there is interaction feedback, you forget that you're using your thumbs as proxies for your feet. And you actually begin to um, sort of augment your imagination with those. And you know, it becomes an invisible interface. So you do actually feel as though your legs are moving. But that's because you can hear the effects of, of your thumbs on a virtual body. Yeah, so my name's Lizzie Ostrom. Uh, I also go under the name Odette Follette, which is the alter ego under which I produce all sorts of events and interactions and experiences around scent and fragrance and how people discover, think about the sense of smell. Um, so, as well as uh, running events about fragrance, um, I'm also uh, working on a few projects about how fragrance relates to people in their daily lives outside of the world of perfume and luxury, um, uh, whether that's in health and well-being or in education as well. Scent is fun, and I found pretty much universally that if you give someone a stick with something sprayed on it, they will love, they will just go for it and they will tell you what they think and they'll shove it to the person next to them and say, what do you think? And they'll have a little argument. It just seems to be a really visceral way to bring people together. Um, and my theory is that lots of, lots of people are really fascinated with smell, but have never had the means or the opportunity to really talk about it and have fun with it. Um, but when you do create the right environment, it's just, it's, it's a very social thing. So the project, uh, it was called Ode, and it was, was supported by the Department of Health, who were running um, a challenge called Living Well with Dementia with a design council. And they wanted to find new ideas, uh, products and services that were going to help maintain independence of living for people who have dementia and also for their families who spend increasing amounts of time caring for their relatives. Um, and what we were working on was uh, the issue of malnutrition because lots of people, uh, well, most people with dementia, especially towards the late stages, will experience critical weight loss um, because they're forgetting to eat, they're, um, they're depressed, they're not getting any kind of sensory cues like you would at home when someone's cooking. Um, and um, once they start losing weight, you can get a kind of downward pattern of physical and also mental health because you're, you could get delirious, um, more frail and shaky because you're not, you know, you're not taking enough calories. What's the way we kind of get excited about food and engage again with eating? Well, it's really about smells. So supermarkets and bakeries know if you smell some fresh bread wafting down the street, you're going to be thinking, oh, I think I need croissants or that coffee smells good. And um, the team I was working with, so it's myself and a design agency called Rod, who are industrial designers and they do a lot of work on um, uh, social design applications. We were thinking, well, if we brought home a sort of food fragrances into homes and care homes where you're eating rather than buying food, can we reconnect people with food um, and create a kind of trigger or a kind of urge? Oh, I'm a bit peckish now. Maybe I'll have a snack, or whether it's a, eating a biscuit when I wouldn't have done, or having a full meal. Could have this help? So after doing these workshops, I became really dogged about this whole area of fragrance and dementia. Um, when I was at the care homes, I noticed there was a lot of visual signage around, so pictures of Hollywood movie stars with an arrow to go to different rooms, because these sorts of cues 
nostalgic use of helping people. And they had, um, you know, medication alarms or beepers that remind them when to do certain things. And every scent seemed to be being used and deployed in these environments except for fragrance. Um, and the other thing is that care homes smell horrible. It's uh, such an unpleasant environment. What does it, what does it feel like when you go into a care home in terms of like the scent? What does the scent make you feel? It makes you feel... It makes you feel brutally connected with the human body and, and, and an undignified process because there's usually a smell of human excrement masked with cleaning product, sort of, sort of lots of um, bad air fresheners. So uh, it's claustrophobic and it, and it smells stale in there. And you just go in and you think, oh God, I, I really want to get out of here. Um, I imagine if you're in there for a long period, you just start to switch it off though. I think fragrance works in two ways here. There's a physiological effect that you get when you smell sweet foods or fatty foods, which can trigger hunger because you're associating a cake. It's that sort of sugar, sugar rush. Um, there, there's some research that suggests that citrus uh, foods like lemon trigger salivation, although the question is you might be salivating but do you want to eat? Um, the other side of things is personal association. So if I smell a chili con carne, and I used to love eating that, do I think, oh, I could just buy really murder some dinner right now? So we had so many questions when we started about um, generational and cultural preferences and whether we need to find specific food aromas that would work more effectively were there smells that would be really effective with loads of with more cross-section of people or we're going to have to pinpoint for every participant what kind of got their appetite going um, and that was really hard because we felt a bit like we were rooting around a dark tunnel and trying all these different tests and experiments to see what would work in a very kind of quick fire way because we had 20 weeks in this process and we had so much to do. <laughs> so how did you do it? How did you identify what sense to put into? Well, we work with a little bit of humour, which is so important because um, I'm not a perfumer and it's such a specialist skill. You train for something like seven years and when it comes to formulating a scent that not only is evocative and pleasant but actually is a sort of high fidelity version of a cake or whatever, you need someone who knows what they're doing. And um, we work with a really good perfumer called Kate Williams who's also a psychologist um, and has done quite a lot of work on um, using fragrance in people with learning disabilities or sen other sensory impairments. So we, we almost started with a wish list and we, we held some workshops in daycare centres and ask people what are your favourite foods. We gave them loads of things to smell to see if there were common likes and dislikes, which was really difficult because I remember we had a spearmint fragrance and um, we had to video these sessions because lots of the participants were saying, oh, I'm not sure about that, it's just toothpaste to me or no, that's not doing anything. But then when we asked them to pass the strip back, they were kind of clutching it. And one guy started sort of relaxing in his chair and talking about the sweets he used to eat as a boy from the penny sweet shop. And he said, oh, I don't really like this. And then the next minute he's kind of holding on for dear life and doesn't want to give it back to us. It is very immersive. And because it is intangible um, and so personal, you can kind of get in a reverie if you find something that really sort of sets you off. And because it's so difficult to communicate with other people, a bit like a dream, oh, this takes me here, you, it's so hard to convey that, that it's, it can be, it can, even though it's social, it can also be solitary as well. Um, but the problem with fragrance is that when it comes to discriminating between odours, um, so that might be which one's a lemon, which one's a lime, or how strong is this, that's quite difficult to do. Um, we've got different responses from people on preference um, when they didn't know what the odour was compared to when they were told. So 
we had a chocolate set and we didn't tell them it was chocolate and we got loads of glass so don't mind that. I, I, I know what that is but I can't put my finger on it. And then when we said it was chocolate it was, oh yes, yes that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we love, love that. that. That's, that's, that's perfect. perfect. And, and so you just, just this, you, when you are told or are given a, a verbal, verbal cue, uh, um, semantic cue, cue as to what a fragrance is, it completely leads you in another direction. direction. So, so you could say, we well, were doing, doing some work on a mango fragrance, and we were, the perfumer didn't tell us it was mango, and it smelled quite metallic, because mango does have a quite a metallic, you smell the right mango, the stone, it, it smells quite sort of steely. And, and then, then he said, said to us, mango. And we'd been in an industrial land, and, and suddenly we were in the world of tropical fruits, and just, just like that, it was absolutely bizarre. And, and so, so that was another aspect of our work, you know, telling people what they're smelling versus not, and what effect that has on their experience of sense. My name is John Wardley. Uh, I am a designer of theme park attractions. Um, I started as a stage manager and I moved from stage management into the movie industry and then from there because I missed the live audience I moved into the theme park industry uh, and probably pioneered the theme park concept in, in Britain. The, the, the feedback that you get from the audience, the applause, the laughter, the gasps, uh, that's something that, 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 that feeds you when you're an entertainer, it's, 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 it's your, your lifeblood really. And when you work in, in the film industry, you get none of that, you know. Things have got to be filmed and dubbed and edited and eventually get projected on the screen many, many months later. And when you're a technician working in the film industry, you don't ever get that wonderful buzz from the audience. Just being behind the, 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 the tabs in the theatre and just hearing that hum of the audience, the anticipation that they have, and knowing that you're going to hopefully take them on an emotional journey of excitement and fun and, and disbelief and, and so on. What you're doing is taking people out of their everyday world and allowing them to explore an imaginary world and immerse themselves in it in many respects. One, One way to suspend people's disbelief is to catch them unawares. But uh, if you can instill a sense of trepidation or uncertainty or fear, they become far more receptive to the sights and sounds and sensations that you throw at them. If they are concerned about their own comfort, safety, emotional stability and all this sort of thing, knowing that they're going to be put on something that is going to put them in apparently a very precipitous uh, and, in, and dangerous journey, then they tend to immerse themselves very, very well. Uh, and that's what tends to happen in the theme part. The theme preconditions you to the experiences that you're about to have. Well, you, you obviously call on people's own experiences. If you take, for example, a haunted house, where everybody has their own idea of what a haunted house might be like. You've seen haunted houses on movies. Very few people get the opportunity to go into a haunted house, and if they do, the chances are they're not going to see anything in any case. So in the theme park, before you go into that haunted house, you know you are going to see something strange, something spooky, something unbelievable, something mysterious, something outside the bounds of your normal experience. So, basically, their brains are engaged. They are, they are already prepared to be immersed in the experience. Um, and so what we call the pre-show in, in any <coughs> amusement ride or uh, theme park attraction is, is very important indeed because it is the pre-show that gets people in the right frame of mind to be able to uh, absorb themselves in the experience that they're about to have. So, so that, that is, is the, the main trick 
And once, once you've got, got people receptive to what, what you're about to do to them, then, by all means, you can surprise them. You want to do that. You're not going to give them necessarily what they expect. But at the same time, the emotional door is open and they are ready to be entertained in, in, in whatever way, with whatever emotions we want to play with, whether it be laughter, whether it be fear, whether it be delight, whether it be enchantment or mystery. The whole palette of emotions we're able to play with. But before we do that, we have got to open the door and make sure that they are receptive to having those emotions uh, manipulated. The pre-show can be, the pre -show can used, be in used in all forms, of all forms of entertainment if you want it. If you want it, even even in the theatre, even, even in the theatre, just sitting down in the seat, just sitting down in the seat, with the glow of the footlights, with the glow the of the footlights curtain, on the red velvet curtain, and the sound of an audience, and the sound of an audience, the sound of an orchestra, the sound of an orchestra tuning up. Uh, that tuning is a pre-show. That, that is a pre-show. That gets people anticipating what, anticipating is, about what is about to come. Um, I um, suppose in a movie theater. I suppose in a movie theater. Um, everything from buying your popcorn to, from buying your popcorn the of, to watching of, the trailers of, 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 of the forthcoming yeah, movies. That, 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 that yeah. also that, that, that is, is the pre-show. It pre just uh, takes you from uh, your from everyday world your everyday through, world, an intermediary through an intermediary warm-up, warm if you like, into the big experience. There's, the secret is to, there's, be, there's able the secret to, is to be able to understand what's going on in their mind. All successful entertainers, whether they be a comedian, Actor, whether they be an or, actor or an opera singer or, or, an whatever, opera singer or whatever, they've still got to have that kind of rapport with the mind of the audience. I acknowledge you know, the fact I acknowledge that for everybody that, for rides everybody that rides in the system, there'll be probably three or four people that don't ride in the system. Now, the now now the unimaginative ways, unimaginative to, design ways coaster, to design a roller coaster, which is something, which is something that designers are still doing. Designers are still doing actually, is to build your roller coaster, to build your roller coaster, put a fence all the way around it, the gate on that fence with a sign on that gate that says entrance, and basically metaphorically, you're saying if you don't want to ride it, stay out, and you're not part of this experience. Now that is not the way I work. If you don't ride Nemesis, if you don't it doesn't ride matter whether you're a, a, kiddie, whether whether you're in a, a, a kiddie in a in a two-year-old kid in a two-year-old kid in a stroll, or an elderly or an elderly grandparent on a with a walking stick or a zimmer frame, you can still be immersed, you can in, still be immersed in Nemesis because it's over and around, you. Over and around you. you. I have seen little tiny babies. I have seen little tiny babies that are, that are in their push chairs, that are in their push chairs, right next to that truck as it comes whizzing around. A roller coaster is not just about being up high above ground. Nemesis has got the Interact, interact with everybody. And I defy and anybody, I to, defy go to, anybody Towers, to go not, to Walton Towers. Certainly, not, get, uh, certainly uh, get a certainly get a degree of, of a degree of, of amazement uh, out of amazement out of out watching, of, nemesis, out of whether watching they, nemesis whether they whether they ride it or not. Whether they ride so it or not. So that's basically the way whether to do you, it. Whether you participate, whether you, whether you participate in the attraction or not, you should still be able to get pleasure or some kind of experience. Some kind of experience. So that's always the starting point. One gets a brief. We want something. We want something. For example, for families. If it's for families, if it's for families, it has to have a fairly broad appeal. It has to be able to physically as well as emotionally be suitable for be suitable for young children, young children to the elderly. It's not going to be too frightening. It's not going to be too frightening. It's got to play on other more positive emotions. Or they might say we want a terrifying roller coaster, a terrifying attraction specifically aimed at teenagers or young adults or young adults. So that's the Starting so that's the starting now, point. If it has, now, if um, it a, has minority um, appeal, a minority of appeal, for, such as uh, for specifically teenagers, uh, specifically teenagers then you look at, well, how, then you could, look that at, well, how could that still intrigue other people? Uh, just other people. The, the, the look, just the, the overall the, look, the, the, look the, the environment of the thing, in which, environment in which we set it. it um, Could it, for example, um, if, it, if it's, example, it's, a, if it, if it's a very intimidating, a, a very intimidating such as oblivion, such as oblivion which at all times, basically which drops you basically vertically down, drops you into, a vertically you down into a hole, and you don't know what's going to happen when you get in that now, hole. Again, now uh, again, uh, that is incredibly, that is incredibly uh, intimidating. Uh, you have to intimidating. get over, you have to a, get certain over threshold a certain in threshold in order to venture onto it. To venture onto it. But at the um, same time, everybody, the same time, can, everybody stand can stand around that hole and watch endless numbers of people, dropping, numbers into of people dropping, into dropping into it and not emerging. So, so um, um, uh, 
there are ways in which, even a, ways in which even a minority of type of attraction um, can still um, can function, still in terms of, function giving, in terms satisfaction of giving satisfaction and, 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 and pleasure to people, pleasure that, to it's people that it's at. not targeted at. Yeah, I, re I remember the first time that I went on Oblivion. In fact, I think it's the only time I went on Oblivion. And I was absolutely petrified. I had to get over that hump initially of, of getting myself into the... Uh, in, into the queue and then onto the ride. And you get up to the very top, if you guys haven't been in Oblivion before, you get up to the very top, it's all quite normal, and you're sort of sitting there looking down at this, this hole, and just before you drop, there's a, a voice that comes into your ear from a speaker right next to you that says, don't look down, and then it drops you. Absolutely the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. And it, honestly, if John at that point had like, done anything to influence me, I would have been like, yes, you can have me, whatever, <laughs> you can absolutely have me. Um, so that gives you a kind of overview of, of three different people who are playing around with, um, with engaging people in ways that, although Nick has done a lot of work with digital technology, um, a lot of his work is not with digital technology, um, it, it ways that, that you can be immersed and engaged that have certain elements that can be incorporated into design, or certainly into, de into the design decisions um, towards influence. So uh, I don't know, Lisa, which slide you're on. Is it the engagement is fleeting, temporal? It is now. It is now, hooray. So that is kind of the overview. That's kind of the, the, the overarching idea that I've pulled out from speaking with these three folks and, and various other people. Unfortunately, one of the um, one of the interviews that I did uh, just didn't come out well enough to, to present it at this particular event. Um, but there's more uh, on a website that I'll, I'll tell you about at the end. But it seems to me that this kind of crucial moment of engagement is, is very quick, it's very temporal, and it's also it's, it's experienced you know, sort of right now. And so you have a very small window in which um, if there is no emotional engagement over a long period of time in which to get your message and in which to change behavior. Um, so the next slide. So let's just focus on the, the elements that I, that I pulled out from Lizzie's, uh, I'm sorry, from Nick's conversation. And what he talks about, which is interesting, that certainly can be done in terms of digital design, in terms of that sort of single temporality, because as everybody knows, it's actually quite irritating when you land on a website and you start to get sound and you're like, oh, where's the sound? You know, I'm, I'm at work <laughs> or, you know, the kids are asleep or something. I don't want the sound on. It's actually interrupting my, my, my experience of this, of this website. Um, some of the things that are really lovely that you can, that you can think about is how functional sound is and how it's inextricably associated with physical objects and how you can invoke that um, with this idea of what it is that you put on screen or how it is that you get people to navigate through. I love the idea that you know how immersed we feel in a space is very much associated with what we hear and how much we can interact with that. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a really interesting element to play with. If we go to the next slide, then we can uh, we can think a little bit about Lizzie's contribution. She, her, her, as her, I, I found it fascinating that that she spoke so much about how social scent is and how much um, it's a kind of a physiological as well as an associative trigger. So that's another that's another element that I thought was quite common between the sound and the scent is how it's associated with something and how it's, it's, it triggers notions of what you've known in the past. Um, and although, as she said, sort of getting the, the, the scent of spearmint right, or you know, the difference between um, a, a lime and a lemon uh, right is quite difficult, there, it, it still can invoke certain reactions. It can still um, send people into this reverie that she talks about. However, she also mentioned something that I think is relevant to, to John, and, and his contribution. So if we just jump forward um, to, the, to the next one, Lisa. Um, and that's very much about the pre-show, just kind of dropping triggers ahead of time just to get people in the, in the right frame of mind for what it is you're about to experience. Oh, I'm about to experience a mango scent. You know, you have like, I don't know, some, some kind of visual cues that are all about, you know, the tropics or something like that, um, really kind of would help you as opposed to having, you know, a, a images of Pittsburgh or, you know, or somewhere in Middlesbrough, really quite industrial senses that would then send you from 
the, the tropics to the, the steely scent that she was talking about when she was talking about the mango. It can really help to kind of to frame and to, to get people in the right scent, the right frame of mind so that you can truly engage them when you sort of hit them with your zinger. I love the, the notion of the audience feedback, and certainly that's something that's, that is um, equivocal to uh, William Castle's experiences and what he, it was that he was trying to convey as somebody who had been in the theater uh, as well as John had. Um, but it's it, the, the delightful thing that I find about roller coaster designers more than anything else is because it, just by going through the pre-show of buying a ticket, you're anticipating something. Um, whereas with the sound and with the scent, it's less anticipation and almost something that's, uh, that's, that's um, uh, sort of happenstance. You kind of go, oh, now I'm, now I'm in, you know, now I'm in the, the, the jungle, now I'm in, I'm in the tropics, or, uh, you know, now I'm in a, a, a situation in which I have to run away from, from an angry tiger or whatever it is. Um, with, with the theme park experience and with that pre-show, you're already ready for anticipation. You're already anticipating a kind of delightful element. Um, all of them were talking about the fact that you have to be quite general when it comes to how you frame the, the senses. Uh, you have to, to use existing tropes, people's knowledge, people's memories, people's um, sort of expectations of what a theme park might be or, or what a, a computer game might be or what um, you know, spearmint might be. And I thought it was interesting that Lizzie was, was pulling out some of these questions of, did we have to think about generational or cultural aspects when it came to triggering people's senses of hunger through the sense? Well, in fact, they, they didn't seem that they needed to. Um, and I thought that a really, really important aspect of what John was talking about was intriguing people who aren't participating. And that's, that's an absolutely a, an enormous lesson when you think about it, just by, by having a roller coaster sort of coming through the park as opposed to being behind closed doors. Um, you know, how is it that you can just get people involved so that you create the buzz so that everybody can, can be immersed even if they aren't actually taking part in the ride? Um, my big question, of course, is, is, and this is on the next slide, is how we can adapt these for, for digital design. Um, and I'd be curious to hear if anybody had any questions or any thoughts about that, uh, because that's that I believe, yeah, that's that's the end of the of the jazz hands, my <laughs> side of the presentation. But if anybody's got any ideas of how that might be incorporated, um, then by all means, this is the moment to share. Or if you have any questions for me um, now, then this is the this is the moment. You've got a hand up, Alex. Brilliant. I can't see, you, so please. Just say your name and then your question. Hi, I'm Shubra. Um, hi, Alex. Uh, I've been following your work for a number of years, so it's always exciting, so I'm slightly biased. But um, <laughs> I just wondered um, what you're describing seems to be um, within the cognitive psychology world um, described as priming, in a sense, mm -hmm. and also in many ways, yeah. and elicit eliciting a Pavlovian response to a, mm -hmm. to a cue. And I just wondered... Um, to what extent do we need to consider the, the sort of darker elements of that ability? I mean, in the hands of corporations or <laughs> governments and stuff like that. That's uh, a great just... question. I've always said that I want to use my my, my knowledge for good, not for evil, um, <laughs> because unfortunately, with the you know, with with this knowledge comes great responsibility, as they say. Um, certainly, I you know, frankly, I think that people are going to be manipulating this to their own ends anyway. And already you're seeing, um, you know, you're seeing, I, I've, I've been looking at a, um, a scent marketing company in the Midlands um, who specifically, you know, puts smells of, of you know, coffee in particular um, environments. I think they even put smells of coffee in coffee shops or, you know, or delis or whatever, which seems slightly, you know, just brew another pot of coffee if you want to do that. Seems a little bit expensive. In order to keep people to stay, you know, stay in the environment and then you know, hand over cash. And you see that same kind of thing again with scent. Um, when people are trying to sell houses, you know, bake, a, bake some bread or make some chocolate chip cookies and people will feel as if you know, your house, the house that you're trying to sell is, is more homely and stuff like that. Ultimately, I think all we can really do is, is throw it out there and see what people do with it. Um, ultimately, these people have been trying to manipulate these elements for a really long time. And that's why you have um, incredible soundscapes in cinema where, you know, you get the, the sort of the, where you get the, uh, the, 
the the crescendo and you know that at this point something's about to happen or you this is at this point you're supposed to cry i've been living in the u.s for the past few months i haven't lived here for 20 years and so i'm kind of coming at it with a fresh eye and i must say there's a whole lot of crescendos in every single aspect on television like ads or i'm i'm crying constantly in ads because of the uh, because of the, the soundscape that they've got you know embedded in the background so corporations are naturally going to gravitate to this and, and in some ways it's corporations who are going to fund a lot of this because they're the ones who have the cash and they they're the ones who are who are looking specifically to, to sell um, that's not necessarily a bad thing but it certainly is something to to think about yeah I hope that answers your question thanks Any question? Sure. No, Dave? yeah Dave White um, Hi, Dave. Hello. Uh, in all of this, in this kind of territory that you're talking about, I'm just interested because it seems to be quite um, focused on consumption rather than production in terms of the individual. So you were talking about audience. Um, I just wondered what, because I think one of the things about the digital and the web is that obviously that, that the potential for a two-way street. So I think one of the challenging areas with with this kind of territory is how how do you see it relating to those kind of forms of engagement where the authorship is not just entirely on one side? That's a really, really lovely question. Um, and, and actually, I don't really have a response to that, except that there are probably ways of priming people to, um, to produce. And in some ways, when you think about influence and you think about how you get people to do stuff, in many ways it has to do with your kind of social environment. Not only your personal, um, your personal notion of efficacy when it comes to the tools that you're using, but also the, the, the sense that is, it's a normative aspect to do. Um, and so in many ways, the, kind of the, the social networks um, have got a lot of things right in terms of influence because they've got this apparent idea that you and your friends are um, are all doing the same thing or the people that you want to be like are all doing the same thing. When it comes to these these types of lessons or these types of insights, um, at the moment, I would say you're right, a lot of it is about production for a consumer. Um, but if these if the ways that these folks are, are talking about creating incredibly immersive um, spaces um, can be uh, democratized in such a way that you don't have to create, you know, some kind of device that squirts scent at you every time you go onto a website, <laughs> for example, which would be awful. It would be so awful. Um, and you can only imagine the sort of hack attacks that would happen from that. Um, but if it kind of is democratized in such a way that, that uh, the ways that uh, designers are creating stuff, or even the way the artists are producing stuff, or people who want to produce stuff, or can learn from these types of insights, then at least it would trickle down so that we would get um, production on all sides, whether it's consumer, or whether it's audience, or whether it's a creator, or you know the various levels of, of there in between. Everybody would be creating more immersive experiences uh, for online. I, mean, I suppose my my underlying assumption in this is that um, the web can't yet, and I say yet in parentheses, replicate the experiences offline because there is so much that, you know, the, the touch, the feel, the sense, um, those elements uh, that people criticize the web for can't yet be replicated. But if there's ways of anybody to produce, um, to produce and to respond and to participate um, using these different insights, then that's something that we could do to create a, a better mirror of who we are offline. And as an aside, um, with regards to the last question, there was a really interesting article, I believe it was in The Atlantic, um, about B.F. Skinner and how many weight loss programs are, are using um, the behaviorist, the, the psychology, psychological behaviorist um, approach to creating apps now to get people to do what they want them to do, specifically with weight loss in the first instance. So uh, yeah, cognitive cognitive psych uh, and behavioral psych are, are certainly two different um, two different approaches, two different ways. Okay. Lucy. 
Um, hi, Alex. I'm, I'm Lucy. Uh, I thought Hiya. maybe I would give sort of a, an anecdotal example of a project I used to work on that now that I saw it, your presentation it makes a lot more sense why it was successful. Um, maybe oh, sweet. I'll, maybe I'll answer or partially answer this idea of can we get people to participate more um, in using things like sound. So I used to work for a startup conservation online kind of game, kind of experience called virtual ecotourism. And the idea is that real ecotourism can be really detrimental to the area it's trying to protect. And not everyone can participate in ecotourism. So you have this, this online experience instead. So how it works is you log into your computer and there's somebody in, um, we did it in Uganda, walking around giving their, their guide, their, their guide basically, and they can walk around and you can type them questions and they'll answer you in real time. Um, and there's a whole community of people watching at the same time who can um, offer questions or whatever. We noticed that what made people the most engaged was when there was some sort of sound cue. So it was really, really low tech, but if, if the guide um, leaned over and splashed the water near a lake, people would all post, oh, that's really cool. Is the water cold? So those, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so, so I guess it, maybe it, it speaks that idea that we are hardwired to think that sound must be nearby. So hearing the sound makes you feel like you're in Uganda. And yeah, so just, that's sort of a just a small example, but maybe there's something there. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that, you know, if there are, if there are clever ways of, of creating that um, to get participation um, or to encourage participation or to, to immerse people, I mean, even even getting people to participate is, uh, is an example of changing people's behaviors. Um, you know, they may be primed and ready to participate, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will when, when you know, when it comes down to it. Um, so you know, if there's if there's sound cues like you're describing, Lucy, or, or you know, other ways of getting people to uh, to lose themselves into the moment, then that might be a way to to encourage participation, to create those those sensory experiences um, that immerse people. But yeah, that's that's a lovely example. Thank you. Any more questions? Quick follow up one here, Alex. Um, do, do you think do you think the interpretation of sounds and all these interactive cues are um, depend on culture as well? To, and to what extent? I mean, can we have these a, and globally facing website with these sound and interactive cues that elicit the same responses in different cultures? Yeah, and um, and I, I mean, I I've, a lot of the work that I've been doing more recently has been thinking very much about the different frames that people approach um, questions with um, or sort of difficult concepts with uh, and culture, uh, cultural, culture, temporality, materiality, all of these things are, are certainly lenses through which that, through which our experiences are, are colored, the way that we perceive things are, are colored. Um, but I found it really interesting that what Lizzie was saying is that, you know, she she was thinking, oh my goodness, are we going to have to do like a, you know, what, what different sense are we going to have to create for different people in the care homes in order to encourage them to eat, you know, to get them to subconsciously in some way desire food. Uh, and her outcome was that there is a shared experience. Um, I'm sure that there will be instances that, that there will be elements that speak to different cultures that speak to different generations, that even speak to different subcultures within, you know, larger countries, etc. But there may be, as as John was describing, there may be certain tropes, there may be certain generic tropes um, that are easily translated uh, that that cross cultures that can be that can be used. But certainly when you drill down and, and you know, I remember when I was when I was working with the Second Life team and they had their, their communities um, their community, uh, sort of the, the, the different national communities, they were very much about, you know, okay, let's, now that we've got something that seems to speak to everybody, um, how do we then make it even more of an immersive experience for these different cultures? How do we, how do we work and localize the experience for these different cultures? And so I think maybe it's a matter of, at, at first instance, so that you don't end up dividing yourself into loads and loads of different, um, you know, going down loads and loads of rabbit holes um, and getting lost down them as I do every time I go online. Um, it's 
about sort of creating a kind of generic and then drilling down for individual experience based upon feedback and also based upon who's picking up on it. So there's, a, there's just one more, there's two more slides. Um, there's more on the same theme. This is the website that I mentioned before. At the moment, it's just got those three um, videos, but I've got, a, I've got an interview with a chef on Wednesday, uh, another chef. I've got an interview with um, a sommelier coming up, and I've been speaking with a friend of mine I just discovered, I literally just discovered, um, who I went to high school with, who, um, <laughs> who designs kind of visitor attractions, whether it is Disneyland and how you walk through the how you walk through the space, um, or you know, like Butlins, he he designs all that. I'm very excited about that. So I'm speaking with him, um, and also this project has actually evolved into uh, one of the one of the episodes of the next series of the Digital Human, which is a Radio Four series that I do that Dave has participated in. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, that is coming out on Monday, the eighth of April, and we interview Nick and Lizzie, and we've also got the the audio, some of the audio that you heard already from John, um, for that program, as well as Terry Castle, William Castle's daughter. So, if you're interested in this and the different ways that the web can't yet replicate human experience, um, that's a that should be a really nice program to listen to. And that's it. Thank you very much to Nick, Lizzie, and John. Um, on the next slide, you can see some of their contact details if you want to get in touch with them or look at the stuff that they do. Highly recommend, definitely, um, if, not, if not looking at all of them, checking out Nick's stuff because it's far more than what he talks about with Papa Sangre. Um, and uh, if you're in London, Lizzie Lund events. And John is just cool. <laughs> and thank you very much, Lisa, for organizing, and Holly, in the corner uh, for, for doing stuff ahead of time. And it's it's lovely to, if not see you all, then at least speak with you from afar. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks very much.